Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. NASA's most critical mission yet, at least in the 21st century, is about ready to head to the launch pad. And this time, we can't have any mistakes. We can't have any landers falling on their side or broken lander legs or any mostly successful outcomes given the circumstances. We either need an unqualified success or Artemis is going to be in a world of trouble. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. So, believe it or not, NASA is going to be attempting a third soft landing on the surface of the moon before the end of the year. We're only talking a few more months, really, before the next CLPS mission. This one, again led by Astrobotic, will attempt to set down in the lunar South Pole region, right in the middle of where NASA suspects all of this lunar ice is. Now, the importance of this mission cannot be overstated. The entire objective for the Artemis mission, that is to say, establishing a permanent presence on the moon, going to the moon to stay, is completely dependent on our ability to find a substantial amount of exploitable water ice at the lunar south pole. We're pretty sure that it's there based on orbital observations and also based on a single mission that impacted the surface of the moon while a probe following the impactor essentially flew right through the debris cloud that was created by the impact. So we kind of created an artificial meteor strike on the moon and then flew a probe through the debris that was created picked up a lot of water ice there, so we're pretty certain that it's there, but we can't say for sure. And also, we don't know what sort of condition that ice is in, and what sort of impurities there may be, how much regolith is in the ice. There's just lots of unanswered questions that really would be better for us to answer before we send human beings to the moon, which is what this mission is all about. And unlike the other two CLPS missions that have preceded it, this one can't have any sort of, well, it was a good enough landing, or we accomplished quite a lot, and so therefore we're going to call it a success. This time, the lander has to set down pretty close to flawlessly, because there is a very big, very resilient, and very important rover that's going to have to be dispatched from that probe, going to have to be deployed from a probe that's in pretty good shape, it can't really be sitting at an angle or on its side or anything like that. It has to be vertical and it has to be in good condition in order for this rover to be deployed. And if this rover is not successfully deployed, the entire mission is gonna be a bust. And if that happens, it's very possible that Artemis itself may be a bust as well. Now, before we get started, I would like to thank Marie Robbins and The Naked Gardener for becoming my latest Patreon supporters here in March. You guys are making a big difference to my ability to support this channel, and we are approximately 40% of the way to our goal of getting 1% of our subscribers involved as Patreon members. And if you'd like to learn how to become a Patreon supporter of this channel, well, it's all in the description. So a lot of us are probably familiar with the CLPS missions at this point. The idea behind this is to prepare the way to scout out the lunar south pole to determine what sort of challenges astronauts are going to experience in this region of the moon before we actually send astronauts there. Because we know very little about this region, at least in terms of first-hand knowledge on the surface. Yeah, we've mapped it 
it extensively, but other than that, we really haven't learned a great deal. Now, Astrobotic has always looked upon their landers as being delivery trucks of sorts. They don't have their own scientific capabilities aside from a few basic instruments. They're designed to carry other people's payloads there, and the Griffin lander that's going to be on its way to the moon here in a few months is the big heavy delivery truck of the Astrobotic fleet. We're talking 625 kilograms worth of payload as opposed to 130 kilograms of payload on the intuitive machine's Nova C. The Nova C's maximum payload in an expanded version is actually only 250 kilograms. So this thing is on a completely different level. And it has to be because it's carrying a huge piece of equipment to the moon. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit more about the lander itself. It is, as we said before, pretty sizable, and that's why it's going to need a Falcon Heavy to complete the journey, not a Falcon 9 to get to the moon. It has five main engines, and they run off of monomethyl hydrazine and an oxidizer, of course, and they're rated at 700 pounds worth of thrust piece. It also has 12 attitude control system engines and the landing is being managed by an experimental piece of technology called the Optical Precision Autonomous Landing Sensor that was developed by the NASA J Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Moog Space and Defense. It's an imaging based terrain relative navigation package and this is the first time it's ever being used. It was supposed to be used on the Peregrine for the first time but the Peregrine of course never got to this point and it consists of a camera and a high performance computer that uses images from the camera and maps stored in the lander's memory to estimate the position of the lander in real time. So lots of experimental equipment being used for the first time on this incredibly important mission and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be unbelievably nervous during the landing process assuming the Griffin gets to that point. Griffin stores its energy inside a lithium-ion battery like a lot of other landers. It's powered by solar panels, therefore it needs to be oriented to face the sun, just like the other probes that we've been seeing lately. And it's only designed to work for a couple of weeks on the lunar surface. However, its payload is going to last a lot longer. Now, Griffin Mission 1 is a dedicated mission. We don't have 20 payloads from different countries and different private companies on board or anything like that. We have one instrument or one piece of payload with one customer and that of course is NASA and the payload is the Viper Rover. This thing is a monster compared to many of the other rovers that we've seen in the past. This thing is sizable, it's resilient, and it has to be because it's surviving one of the toughest environments in the solar system, the lunar south pole, where things can get unbelievably cold when you get into the shadows. It's about the size of a golf cart, about 1.5 meters by 1.5 meters by 2.5 meters, and it weighs 450 kilograms, a half ton rover and it has three spectrometers on board and also a one meter drill to gather samples from deeper down inside the regolith. That's it. No other instruments. It's designed to look for water on the surface and a little bit beneath the surface and it has no other function besides that. Well, of course, its other function is to survive on the lunar south pole, which is a huge task unto itself much more difficult than Mars in many respects. Its top speed is 0.45 miles per hour or 0.72 kilometers per hour, not 7.2 kilometers per hour, 0.72 kilometers per hour, and it's being driven in real time. That's another big advantage and also a unique challenge. The drivers on Earth are going to be able to control this thing without having to do any pre-programming so commands will be transmitted and the rover will be off to the races. That also is very important because the rover has to cover a substantial amount of ground 
while there's sunlight and get into the correct location to shut down safely before it gets reactivated after nightfall. Yeah, it's going to be operating for a hundred days and the only way to do that is with insulated heat pipes and radiators along with a very good battery that's capable of surviving temperature variations of up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit between sunlight and shade. Now on top of that, we really don't know what the environment is going to be like at the lunar south pole. The regolith might be hard and compacted, or it might be fluffy, or it might be somewhere in between. So Viper is designed for unprecedented agility. The rover can drive sideways, diagonally, spin in a circle, and move in any direction without changing the way it's facing. If it encounters soft regolith, it'll even be able to walk on its wheel wheels by moving each wheel independently to free itself. Now, as I mentioned before, the extreme swings in light and dark at the poles of the moon are nothing like those our rovers have experienced on Mars. And so we have to be able to survive these extremely long and fast moving shadows that can freeze a rover solid. The solar powered Viper must retreat from these advancing shadows as it seeks out the right territory to sample while maintaining communications with Earth. Periods of darkness will be long, up to one one Earth week, so Viper will be periodically parked in identified safe havens at high elevations where the darkness only lasts about four days. Combining all these needs makes for complicated route planning that has to be done very quickly before the lunar night arrives. Viper will also be the first rover with headlights because it's going to be venturing into regions of the moon where the sun has never touched. And by the way, the rover will be operating on the western edge of the Nobile crater on the Mons Molten region of the moon's south pole. Once again, nothing has ever explored this region before. It will be roving around for several kilometers, looking for ice in complete darkness or regions of occasional light and also constant sunlight. And once it enters a permanently shadowed location, it will be operating on battery power alone and will not be able to recharge these batteries until it drives to a sunlit area, which means if it gets stuck in one of these regions even for a few days, it's most probably dead meat. Now as I mentioned before, the rover is equipped with three different spectrometers and a drill. That's it. It has a neutron spectrometer system that detects subsurface hydrogen and potentially water from a distance, suggesting prime sites for drilling to look for water ice in greater detail. It also has something called the Near Infrared Volatile Spectrometer System, or the NERVES. This is something that's been used before. It analyzes mineral and volatile compositions, determines whether or not the hydrogen it encounters belongs to water molecules or to hydroxyl. Of course, hydroxyl is a lot less useful. And then you have the Mass Spectrometer Observing Lunar Operations, or the M-SOLO, and this analyzes mineral and volatile composition. It measures the mass to change ratio of ions to determine what sort of contaminants and trace elements might be in the ice samples that the rover is able to extract. So this thing looks for water ice. It looks for the quality of water ice and determines whether or not we're able to make use of it. That is its only function. That is the only objective of this mission, but it is a critical objective. Without this water ice, we won't be able to manufacture in situ rocket fuel. We won't be able to manufacture in situ breathing oxygen. We won't be able to manufacture in situ drinking water. All of these elements, all of these resources, Sources are absolutely vital to the long-term survival of a lunar colony. So if this mission fails, if the Griffin lander fails to set down safely on the lunar surface and fails to deploy this lander, then we have none of the information that we need to make sure that astronauts are going to be able to survive for the long term on the lunar surface. We are most probably going to have to start a whole new mission 
all from scratch, which is the last thing that we need right now given all the problems we've been experiencing with Artemis up to this point. The pressure is on NASA and Astrobotic in a huge way right now. It would have been so much better if Peregrine had at least been able to attempt a lunar landing, given how many similar systems it uses, but unfortunately it didn't. And the LiDAR landing systems utilized by the intuitive machines Nova C is fundamentally different than what Griffin is going to be using to set down on the moon, so their experiences were not terribly useful either, aside from a lesson learned about making sure that every single component is installed on the lander before you put it on the Falcon Heavy. And herein lies a bit of a problem when it comes to the whole CLPS mission concept. Concept. We are entrusting the future of the Artemis mission to a system that's in the grip of fixed price contracts and profit margins. If a company is beginning to run into the red on a project, they really can't afford to go above and beyond double checking, triple checking every system to make sure that there are no problems whatsoever. The more time you spend doing things like that, the more money you lose and therein might lie a problem with the whole CLPS system. Is it really going to work if profit margins are more important than mission success or failure? Well, we're going to find out when Astrobotic attempts to land on the moon again sometime before the end of this year. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. It's very important to the success of my channel. And as always, stay angry about space.